everybody. Uh, happy to see you. Uh, welcome for the people on the live stream to the... I'm sorry. Yes, are we okay? Uh, for the people on the live stream, uh, special attention um, to the expert meeting called Conversations of, on Solidarity. We are here in the middle of uh, a project uh, meeting in Madrid, hosted by Escuela de Escritores, to uh, talk about our uh, talent development project, uh, SILA. I'm so happy to see you all here. We are going to talk a lot about solidarity today. Um, but first, maybe introduction of myself for the people who are here or online who do, don't know me. I'm Kim van Kaan, I'm the project coordinator of SILA and I work as a talent developer uh, at Wintertuin in the Netherlands. And I'm hosting this panel together with Frank Tazelaar, who Hello. is, shall I say it or do you? Yeah, you can say it. <laughs> uh, who is the director of Wintertuin and initiator of this beautiful project. Um, and because it was his idea, he can explain what it actually is. So SILA, uh, for those of you not in the room, uh, and maybe for those of you in the room that don't know, um, is a talent development project um, involving translators mainly and writers, and is aiming at creating a European context for writers and translators, um, exchanging um, knowledge and working together. Um, within these countries that you can see here, um, so we have partners in, um, in Italy, in Turin, Scuola Holden, Goga in Slovenia, Crocodile in Serbia, Next Space Foundation in Bulgaria, Philit in Romania, and now I have to pronounce it right, the Krakow Festival Bureau, I can say it right, this, yes, <laughs> in Poland. Uh, the, the organization, Irena, I will tell it right away now, the, that organizes the International Book Arsenal Festival. You can say later uh, what is the name of the organization fully. Uh, the Czech Literary Center in the Czech Republic, um, Vlaams Nederlands Huis de Buren in Belgium, and also from Belgium, Passaporta. And of course here, Escola de Escritores, our hosts um, for this beautiful meeting, and we are from Wintertuin in the Netherlands. So, 11 countries, um, and Kim, how many writers are involved? 66 for this current edition that we are now kicking off. We are in the middle of selecting our participants um, and from September on they will start exchanging and meeting each other uh, online, live, uh, through uh, texts and translations. Uh, so 33 writers in total, uh, 99 emerging translators, uh, one from and to every language combination, which is, I think, unique uh, to have them. Um, uh, we are here with 50 team members. We are in total uh, uh, 53 team members. Some people couldn't be here. Um, and this meeting, uh, for those who don't know, was dedicated to um, making sure all the partner organizations know what they need to do to best support our participants from September onwards. Um, so yesterday we had eight hours of uh, extensive meeting on the project plan, the project planning and its implementation. Uh, and today we are here to exchange with you on ideas on literature and its position in the current world. Um, I'm, I, I would say. Yes, um, one, of the, one of the topics of SILA, I think, is, um, is also the topic of this conversation is solidarity between translators and writers, of course, between the organizations and the people, the talent that we are um, developing or, or guiding but also um, in the relation between the literary organizations that we are, the writers that we are, the, the, the translators that we are, and, um, and the societies that we are part of. So uh, this is what we are going to talk about today. We have two panels. Um, uh, I will later on introduce the first panel. Um, the first panel will be um, about solidarity and outreach, as you can see here. And the essential question that we are going to ask is what is needed for literature to take its role in society? How can stories and writing play a change-making part in healthcare, migration, climate change, crisis, and wartime, etc., etc.? Many topics will, uh, will be um, introduced now. Uh, we will um, introduce the first panel, and we will do the same in the second panel uh, with two short videos from makers, uh, writers from outside this room and outside this project. Uh, we will have Rita Richardson, a writer from Ghana, and Rebecca De Witt, she's actually an alumni from SILA 1. Um, and um, they will be uh, introducing the questions to us, and then later on I will introduce you. 
Yes. Okay, first up, uh, Rita Richardson from Ghana. Hi, I'm Rita Richardson from Ghana. I'm a theater practitioner and a filmmaker. I basically tell stories through writing, um, play and drama directing. I'm an actor. So I'm an artist with my main focus being on um, social and environmental awareness in communities, youth, um, young adults uh, to the old and age in our in our society because it's all about for me individual to community to the na national growth and development so, so for instance some of the projects i have done or i get to do it's raising awareness on environmental health and climate change where i come from in my country we serve it, we suffer a lot of um environmental uh, pollution we need to protect our environment right from our capital city in Accra to the rural areas we have human negativity um, activities polluting our um, streets all the way to the water bodies we, we dump waste materials in the street if you come to Accra you see it in many places that you marvel at wow what is going on the beach just now are not safe to swim in and so and then you go to the communities we have mining activities severe mining activities that the uh, the people seem to be thinking about the like commercial the, <laughs> and not thinking about the safeness of the water so we we gonna have many sources of water right from the waterfalls to the lake to the stream to the river what have you so we have pure natural water resources to drink from but as i'm talking to you now everything 99 percent of our water sources are polluted by these mining activities then there is deforestation where for commercial purposes the people are convinced locals are convinced by the city people foreigners our political leaders to cut down trees for commercial purposes to make some money yes and there's severe unemployment issue in ghana so poverty is high and people try to do everything or anything possible to for survival so we cut down the trees, yes, we need it, but we don't plant new one. So we had projects. For instance, my, our last um, project, a recent project had been on um, planting trees and saving our waters. And it was a success. We had workshop right through schools, um, basic and senior high schools, to have them see the relevance of saving our planet protecting our um, natural resources, green vegetation and our waters. And it was a success that the student pledged to become environmental activist. And then the locals, fishermen, farmers, and even Ill illiterate become, at the end of the day, join the community to help save our planet. Now, as a writer, as an artist, who at the same time, with the focus or the priority to use my work for activism. I, I am hoping that I have others out there like me. So my question to you writers all over the world and wherever you are is that how do we or how do you as writers come contribute to social community and environmental um, well-being for the people and for the world we live in? Thank you. So that was uh, Rita. We'll get back to her uh, in the, during the panel. Next, we're going to listen to Rebecca De Witt. It's only audio, uh, so you can relax and close your eyes maybe a bit. Um, her book, Declaration of Dependence, was only just uh, recently published in Spanish um, in February. Um, so check it out if you're curious. Um, and she was an alumna of uh, SILA 1. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rebecca de Witt. I'm a writer and a theater maker from the Netherlands. I also participated in the first CELA edition many years ago. And Kim van Kaam asked me to reflect on the central questions for the first panel. 
So what is needed for literature to take its essential role in society? How can stories and writing play a change-making part in healthcare, climate crisis, migration? Well, to answer this question, I think, first of all, to differentiate between stories and language on one side and literature on the other side. I think sto for stories and language already play a change-making part in, in migration, healthcare, climate crisis. I mean, it is stories that legitimizes the way we deal with the migration crisis. It is stories that legitimizes the way we deal with the planet. And it is also stories and language we need to move back or move away from these stories, these paradigms. So they they are an essential part because they represent our values and it is values that legitimize or delegitimize certain actions in the world. Why I think we, it is important to differentiate bete between literature and stories and language is because of the way literature is produced. So publishing houses and how we, how we represent writers. And, and I, what, what I think is problematic in the way we represent writers at the moment in the media or how re writers represent themselves is that they are always splendid individuals with individual splendid minds and and it's also the way publishing houses um, put their writers in the market it, it's it's one big story of individualism and and if there's one thing that we need at the moment it's solidarity and if there's one story that attacked solidarity it's individualism so i think um we need to reframe the the, the profession of the, of how how we put a writer in the in the market or how we represent what writing is because you cannot write without the community without language which is per definition um yeah made in an ecosystem there's no, i mean there's no meaning to language if it's not for a community so uh, but this ecosystem is always left out uh, when we represent writers and i think this is one of the great things about the cela project that 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 has um so much more ecosystem into its representation because the translators are also so much part of what writing is. And for, for as a writer, this was also very, very important that you could be in solidarity with the content, uh, the content and, 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 and the book um, together, instead of having to be an individual writer with your individual idea. I thought this was very, um, yeah, for Adaming. <laughs> uh, maybe someone can, uh, can translate that for me. So this this presents you, I guess, with with an with a, uh, an, uh, a difficult question because you are going to put writers into the market um, and put pictures of them in folders, and it's in it's in these little things that we sort of retell the story of individualism. That it, that it's, and I think it's a very productive problem. Uh, because it's it's about this yeah we need to change the story of who we are as humans because we are far more like dependent in our ideas and and um, the way we are on each other than than we want to believe so is there a way in which you as as literature producers can can think of other ways of of representing writers other than as splendid individuals Okay, good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. So <clears throat> these are the two questions, and more questions, I think, that we are going to try to talk about um, with this panel. Um, maybe you can introduce yourselves uh, a little bit further than, than I will shortly uh, mention your name. So Ella, um, what are you doing in, in your organization? Um, can, you, can you just explain a little bit? Can you hear me well? Because I'm not having mic, so I'm always insecure. But I, I can see head snoring. Um, should I in, uh, introduce myself and tell the best practice or just introduction? Maybe, uh, maybe that's a good idea. Uh, we were talking before, when we talk about these questions uh, that Rita was putting forward and also um, um, Rebecca, of course, 
do we have best practices that we think of? So maybe that's a good idea to start with the best practice. Yeah, so um, I work for the Krakow Festival Office, uh, which is a municipal institution based in Krakow, of course, as the name says. Um, and this institution is responsible for culture in the city. And one of the most important pillars of this institution is being responsible for Krakow UNESCO City of Literature Program. Um, because we are part of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, which means that we put particular focus on literature and we put it in our politics and future development. And I'm telling this because um, it's one uh, crucial point for answering the question of solidarity in general, because our mission and our goal is to build a sustainable program for the whole year, not only festivals, not only events, but we're responsible for long-term long -term programs and strategizing, which is, I guess, important when you want to really build a base for solidarity and you want to build your audience to be involved and to be included, not only in participating and receiving, but also in building the program. Uh, so what we do on a daily basis is uh, trying to involve as many partners as possible and um, build our program in a very uh, sustainable and inclusive way. Uh, and this is this collective power we have. That we have like the actual power. We have a power, a symbolic power and power of maybe some money because you know we are funded by the city of Krakow. But we have also this collective power which, which could be bottom up. So if we want to uh, reach out to the group that should be at the audience for a project, we can easily do it. And we believe that the building those partnerships are important in the process of preparing the offer for them. For example, we are in the process of um, publishing four uh, graphic novels for young adults, and each volume is dedicated to one underrepresented group. We've been just published um, one about LGBTQ plus community, the next one will be about Roma community, then Jewish and Muslim community. And what we do in this project is, instead of just hiring an artist and hiring a writer, is make, what we do is making a process of social consultation. So we invite young people and we ask them, what are your problems for today and for this moment? What would you like to see in this graphic novel? Who, who you think is the audience. So this is the way that builds not only the, the not creates the product, but also builds this, um, this sense of solidarity because I think it's important to include people uh, before the actual uh, output will be, uh, will be released. So that would be something that is connected also to, to my, and my colleagues' daily work that we try to be really sustainable in the process of programming as well. So this is a collective effort then with the audience and, uh, and you call it social inquiry? Uh, you mean the, the, yeah, the process? With consultations? Consultations, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Mm. And, and everyone is a, a participant, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, also the audience. This is, in, this is an interesting answer. First, uh, um, go at the answer for, uh, to, to the question of Rebecca. Thank you. Denise, what is your role in your organization and do you have a best practice? Yes. <coughs> um, I'm a cultural producer at uh, Wintertown. Uh, I work in the impact uh, department. And uh, what that means, uh, I work with um, people that uh, doesn't have actually a place uh, in a podium. So, in, on a stage. Yeah, so uh, we work with a group of people that are not uh, really visible or that do not get a voice. So uh, we work with people with a migrant uh, background. We work with elderly people. Um, yeah, and we, we do projects uh, to give these uh, people a place to, to say what they want to say. So one of our projects is the Schreiberplatz. So um, this is a project of uh, 10 workshops so they come together, um, they are people do, who are learning Dutch, and they write stories. And we publish um, these stories uh, in a book, and uh, we release this book, and uh, uh, we do a presentation. So they really feel as uh, writers. So they are really doing something um, to give back to the community. and. Um, uh, thinking about the question of uh, Rita, 
uh, I found quite interesting when she said that uh, um, what uh, um, the writers can do, and uh, I think what writers can do is to work closer to the community, listen to what the community needs. And uh, this is what we also try to do in this project because we invite um, the writers that are in our, in our um, development program. So um, they come to the workshops and they teach these um, amateur writers how to write. So the writer is not only uh, busy with writing his own book, but he's also in the community doing this kind of social projects. So I think we can make this bridge and, uh, and uh, do not uh, look at the writer as this uh, isolated person. So the writer also has a, a, a responsibility to work with the community and listen to the com community, listen to what, what are the needs mm. outside. Wonderful, so this is a completely different uh, way of working as a writer than the splendid individualism that Rebecca was speaking of. Exactly. Yeah, okay, thank you. Irina, uh, what is your role in, in, um, in your organization in Kiev? Um, do you have a, an example or a best practice? Um, thank you. Um, I'm a, a, f a head of fundraising department at the uh, cultural institution, uh, uh, Mestetsky Arsenal, uh, which is located in Kyiv, and we uh, do different programming, which is also uh, about uh, art, contemporary art exhibitions and uh, heritage uh, culture exhibitions. And we organize um, a book festival uh, every, every year. Uh, when it is possible. So uh, this year in May uh, 30th will be the next edition. Uh, we are getting ready for this. And <coughs> uh, here I would like to uh, mention that I'm uh, coming uh, from, um, I, I have, uh, I'm taking these questions from a little bit wider uh, context. And I would say that um, we, we not specifically t uh, work with translators, um, or writers directly. However, we do similar project as uh, Denise mentioned, uh, when we organize um, a contest for uh, teenagers uh, who uh, are invited to um, write an essay on a specific subject. And we publish all of the uh, essays on our website. And last year, uh, it was also uh, published in print. Uh, the top uh, short list uh, was translated into English and published in print. And it was uh, used as a tool in a way to, um, to provide uh, an art therapy um, uh, effect or instrument uh, for, uh, for teenagers who are processing trauma being in war and maybe being abroad away from their, par their parent uh, or uh, returning back missing their um, friends. And it's like uh, also nurturing uh, writers within the community. We didn't uh, limit it the applicants. Uh, they could apply from wherever they are in the world. And uh, we were very excited to see the, uh, f the feedback uh, from those who were in Kyiv and who came to the launch of, of the book. For them, it was just a, a huge motivation and because this project also is f uh, followed with the educational program on creative writing and uh, we invited uh, from um, Britain um, speakers uh, who are writers who shared their experience. It was uh, a very... Um, emotional, but also um, I, I feel like a beneficial project. But here I also would like to really quickly mention and jump into a wider context because we now are in, um, in a war and uh, solidarity is also about the support from within. Mm -hmm. And um, here I would like to mention the <coughs> way we felt supported uh, from the very first day on February 24th, 2022, 
it was the first day when the Vilnius Book Fair uh, has its opening, and uh, on, they, on that day, um, they um, immediately changed their programming by uh, highlighting Ukrainian participants, by uh, drawing media attention to uh, what is going on, and within three days, they, they together with other professionals from the ba Baltic countries, they issued a call uh, to other book fairs, especially leading book fairs like uh, Leipzig uh, or Frankfurter Bookmesse, Bologna Children's Book Fair, uh, to seize uh, any uh, contacts with Russian um, artists or um, institutions. And within a week, uh, we felt uh, 12, 12 fairs and festivals responded um, condemning whatever uh, Russia was doing. Within a uh, few, a little few more uh, weeks, uh, maybe 26 directors of the festivals um, supported this letter. And um, this is uh, not very common uh, in other sectors or areas, for example, like um, classical music, uh, operas and everything. In, in the literary book uh, um, sector, it was really very, uh, felt a huge support. And that was very important for, for the Ukrainians overall and for uh, book industry professionals as well to feel that support. Wonderful. I think <coughs> um, Rebecca was talking about splendid individualism, but this is another part of the story, of course. Um, as I listen to the three examples that you've given, the, the way you work, um, and I think you already mentioned the word uh, emotional. There is this word that we um, cannot or hardly translate in English. It's, it's very well put, I think, emotional labor when it when you work with communities, when you work um, outside the commercial field, but uh, as you mentioned, Denise, uh, um, with the underrepresented as you do, you, you have to uh, have a different strategy um, than you would have just uh, representing a writer. Um, but there are also obstacles in this, of course. This is not something that you do easily. Can you, can you share with us some experiences that you have when it comes to this emotional labor that you have to, that you have to put in, in your work, and, and what are the obstacles um, when it comes to um, creating solidarity from our art or from our, our, our business? That's a, that's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess my first guess would be that we are our own obstacles because it's really easy to feel comfortable with doing anything because it's something which is appreciated right now, but it's, it doesn't really make a difference. So it's uh, really, really hard to spot the gap between doing uh, a meaningful thing for the community, mm. which, which really answers the, the needs of the community, and doing something only for the sake of doing something. And it's really hard, it's hard, hard to find balance because the main goal should be to really help people underrepresented or to build a community mm. or solidarity. And it's easy to just, you know, drift away to the uh, just being happy with doing anything <laughs> because, you know, we feel like yeah, yeah. doing something. So that is something that maybe is not a popular opinion, but I guess we should be all aware of this. That so we have to, you know, somehow map the needs. Yes. Um, and this means, uh, talking about emotional labor, being in contact. Yeah. So not thinking from maybe from our business, from, from, uh, from the writing itself, but maybe reversing it and start with listening, is that? Yes, and being a more like a servant, um, yeah. or like people who are responsible for answering the really existent needs, rather than making up ideas and coming up with the projects that are satisfying mostly for us and you know, they help us feel confident and comfortable with mm. doing something for the other underrepresented group. The, I, I guess the dialogue and just yeah. thinking about the others is the crucial point of this. Well, there we have, as, as uh, Rebecca, I, I, I have to repeat it because it's so well, it's well found, the splendid individualism, mm -hmm. which I think is well connected to this whole concept of genius of the, the, the author. Um, Denise, how do, you, how do you cope with this? Because um, you work with writers and we all know that the writers have something to say but you have to make them listen. Um, 
or at least you try. Yes. Um, um, wh wh what is your experience in this? Is, is, is the writer uh, capable of listening, as, as Ella is saying, or um, is the writer mainly focused on selling books or selling rights? Or no, I think they are really able to listen. Uh, sometimes we have to force a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, they can listen, of course. Okay. Um, I, I would <laughs> describe the way that we work a little bit uh, chaotic. So um, for people who like uh, um, rules, um, I would say that uh, impact projects are not your place. Because it's really, uh, you don't know what's going to happen the next day. So um, to begin with, um, you have to be available 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Because uh, sometimes uh, the participants of this kind of projects, they're going to send you a message in the middle of the night because this is the time that they have. And um, they won't uh, wait until the next day to get an answer because they have a urge, uh, an urgency uh, to live, to do things, because most of the time they come from a really difficult situation. So you have really to be open to them. And um, our methodology with the Schreiberg uh, Platz um, is basically, as um, you were saying before, uh, in the first session, uh, we don't have a plan. We go there, we have an introduction round, and we listen. We ask uh, what you want to do. And sometimes they just look at us and say, oh, we were waiting for a lesson. But uh, no, we are not here to give you a Dutch lesson, but uh, we are here really to uh, hear from, hearing from you what you want to write. It's a column, it's an article, what do you want to talk about? Uh, it's about your feelings. It's about uh, um, what is happening in your country. It's about uh, art. What is about? And uh, we just listen. And um, can, I, can yes. I ask why is it is important that literary artistic organizations like Wintertuin, like Bookers, like all here are take that responsibility and that position? Um, because um, I believe that uh, uh, we are here to tell stories and the stories are in, in society, are with people. If you, if you don't talk to people, uh, you don't have the stories. And uh, I think literature uh, exists to make a, a difference uh, in life, to project futures, to imagine what can happen. Literature is there to make change. And uh, you can only make change uh, in society. So um, for me, there is no way to uh, separate these two things. So literature, histories, they are connected to people. And uh, you can only do that if you are involved in, 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 uh, in uh, community projects. And also, so. if I might add something yeah. to this, uh, yeah. also there is almost no one to step in and take this role. I mean, or maybe just a few actors in this too, because we have the market, the mm. publishing market, which is obviously focused on completely different aspects. Yeah. Uh, we have authors and translators that m might not have enough power and, and not have enough you know, courage to do it. And we are like publicly funded mm. mostly, so we like we have to. This is our mission. This is our role. Yeah. So we are like we've been created to be this uh, in between broker and this this uh, those institutions that speak out and take responsibility for something which is valuable, important, and we just fulfill, we fill this this gap in a way. And this is just our role. So this is natural for us. And I can imagine it's it's also quite demanding, right? Um, uh, as you say, the, the market is on one hand very differently organized. We deal with, with the writers and the translators and we deal with the, uh, the, the, the society, as you, as you mentioned it. Um, what is, what is um, needed, what kind of competences, Irina, do you think that we need to be able to fulfill this role, as you say, as a broker between all these um, dimensions in, in that field? What, do, what, what are the competences that we need? Can you, can you reflect on that? Uh, perhaps uh, one of the main would be the willingness to uh, 
understand the other side and uh, accommodate uh, with uh, what they need and listen. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, sometimes it feels like um, you receive offers uh, when from the person or the organization who didn't uh, learn or research the question or the context. And it may at some point seems um, inappropriate. Yeah. For example, inviting um, a Ukrainian um, public figure or artist or whoever on a panel with the Russian sp uh, speaking or, or Russian artist, which is totally inappropriate at the time of the genocidal war, which is still going on. And these writers uh, whose stories we want to hear, we, uh, we know that they are right now on the front line, many of them, mm -hmm. and many of them already uh, were killed, uh, like Victoria Amelina, Maxim Kravtsov, we have a list of them. And uh, in, in this uh, situation, you cannot, um, it's, it's like s someone didn't do their homework uh, or uh, learned what is going on, what is the deep root of the situation and, um, and offering this, um, uh, it, it's, it might be inappropriate. But uh, about the stories that you mentioned uh, that uh, we, we tell the <coughs> stories, uh, here I would like to mention one of the projects uh, which is led, uh, um, it's uh, a dictionary of war uh, written by a Ukrainian writer, Ostap Slavinsky, who volunteered during, uh, he didn't, uh, he volunteered during the, fir uh, the first month and he communicated with many uh, Ukrainians who uh, were displaced or they, uh, they were uh, fighting or they were just needed some help and uh, he um, wrote their stories first in his note books, but then he compiled a dictionary of war-related uh, terms, the new, new meanings of words that we received because of the, this uh, trauma and tragedy we lived through. And uh, each word in, in this dictionary is explained through a small story of one person. And that is something that uh, gives uh, a humane um, uh, face to this experience. And it was already translated into 14 languages. I know that uh, there is also a project, uh, our colleagues from Krakow already applied for a grant to bring um, this uh, readings and translation of this uh, poetry into the choreography. It's a different way to translate, um, uh, to bring it um, to Poland. So hopefully this grant will be supported. Um, but I think these stories, uh, if we are willing to hear them, then we should uh, make an effort to, um, uh, to listen uh, carefully. And also when I listen to you, I think what you also need from your perspective, from the Ukrainian perspective, is the international dimension, right? Uh, international solidarity. Um, what, what do you need at this point from, from Europe or from organizations as they are here, um, um, or from this project, um, um, for, the, for that matter, um, when it comes to um, being able to do these things, uh, to represent these writers, these stories, is there is there something that you are uh, that is lacking, or something that you that you are aiming for? Uh, well, um, already being in this project is r really uh, a privilege because uh, it's a way for us to uh, introduce Ukrainian writers and translators to a wider uh, European audience, and. Um, we really truly appreciate all your efforts <laughs> and that's not just for a good word but uh, you helped us to uh, go through this process of administration very much and being not very um, strict to, to specific rules but be being flexible that is what 
what maybe every organization would need if they go into the international partnership, because right now um, many Ukrainians ha ha were forced to leave the country. Uh, there is lack of uh, workforce, especially in cultural institutions. Uh, it is uh, not that much well paid as, for example, positions in a humanitarian organizations international that would come to Ukraine and also would compete with uh, <coughs> cultural centers and museums and festivals uh, for uh, expert um, labor. And um, so helping to lessen the burden of administration within the project and having these projects together, this is a huge support but also understanding that this lack of uh, workforce uh, um, and uh, it adds more pressure on the staff. So sometimes maybe the partnership would not be the best uh, case in your programming. Perhaps you can involve, engage Ukrainians who are already present in your country and who can play a role of uh, an ambassador mm. for their culture and present it uh, to the local communities. And that would be also a way to integrate um, them into the community and vice versa. Mm. Mm. That's a good point. Ella, you have a, a lot of uh, Ukrainian refugees in your city. Do you see possibilities for, for cooperations like this? Uh, definitely, because uh, we've been having a significant Ukrainian community for years in Krakow. Mm. Obviously, for two years, it's, it's even larger. And we, because it's not only a physical closeness, but also cultural closeness and a bit of language closeness. <laughs> uh, so we try to develop all the possible partnerships that we can. And you made a very valid point that we should be using the resources we have. Uh, that's why, for example, we have a bookstore run by Ukrainian uh, NGO, and this is our daily partner to reach out to to ask about any recommendations, mm -hmm. advice, to you know get them um, to know our programs. Uh, so th <coughs> this is something that we are really open to. Uh, and uh, in the Creative Cities Network, we have two Ukrainian cities, Lviv and Odessa. Mm -hmm. And we have wonderful colleagues there, and they are present at every international meetings. And this is also relevant what, what, did, what you said, Irena, uh, because they always travel, they speak up, they say uh, they somehow m raise the awareness about what is going on in Ukraine, but not, um, but mostly about the cultural field. So um, this is, I guess it's important to remember that we have like great resources and we are so close that we can, we can be great partners for ourselves. So I'm very happy that you are in Sila and we have other connections because we also would like to offer something for the Ukrainian community. We've mm -hmm. been doing this for years uh, and we've been doing like workshops for children uh, from Ukraine and we are doing literary residencies for Ukrainian uh, female writers. But I think it's still a lot of uh, to do and it's a huge gap to fill because this society is changing and a lot of people are staying in Poland yeah. and probably will stay and, and have been living there for years. So this is something that will become a part of our uh, society in the, in the following 10, 20 years. So the society will be changing and adjusting to the situation. It's, a, it's a something that we should be preparing for. Mm -hmm. And in terms of solidarity, as you as you mentioned, you can you can provide uh, with um, with the program. Um, is there also um, something that you need or aim for in working, uh, for instance, in this project, uh, working internationally? What does the international dimension of your work um, contribute to to the the way you work with the communities back in Krakow or the way you work in general? I guess the most, uh, the, the highest value of every international collaboration is gathering best practices. I'm, at least this is my personal mm -hmm. opinion that the, the huge value of meeting people and traveling is getting to know what they do, how they do, and what's the, what's the output of this. Because um, we are really eager to know how things are organized and conducted in other countries. So getting best practices from across the world and sharing best practices is something that could be really powerful because even if it's not easily implemented or applicable in, in our context, this is something that gets us thinking. So we can think about this and we can just be inspired by other practices. So I guess this is the, the greatest opportunity to just talk to people mm -hmm. and uh, be inspired and be able to implement that yeah. at home. 
And, and, and Denise, for you, you, you your, your project is very local based. Um, but you are one of those newcomers learning Dutch from the Schrijverplaats. Yeah. You, you're now leading it, but you were yeah. once way back, you were uh, uh, one of the participants. Exactly. Um, what does the international dimension um, contribute to your very local uh, uh, oriented uh, program? Yeah, I, I think we, we uh, talked a little bit about this uh, early uh, this morning here. Um, we, in general, we think about uh, uh, international uh, internationalization also something that, uh, um, yeah, you are in your country and you need to um, export your products, uh, your books and your things. But we don't think about interna internationalization in the other way around. So um, what we have in this project is exactly the other way. So uh, we, we have uh, participants from Syria, from uh, Ukraine. Um, we just started an, an, a new edition last week and uh, we had uh, three participants from Ukraine and uh, I was really touched for one, uh, one saying of one of them. She said, um, I'm doing this project, I just joined it because I don't want uh, the world to forget what is happening in my country. I'm here to put in paper so that uh, everyone uh, will not forget about it. And um, so I think um, that uh, in this kind of projects, we work locally, but uh, we work with international pairs because uh, we don't deal with the participants of someone who receives something, but they are active uh, participants, they are really the ones who are doing, who are, uh, who are writing. So, uh, and then you can see um, the, their perspectives here. So you can see what they think in Iran, in Iraq, in Ukraine, in Brazil, in Colombia, Equator. So you can just see the different perspectives in this country. So instead of uh, from here to there, from there to here. Wow. Well, when it, <laughs> comes to, when it comes to opposing the splendid individuality, I think we, we've come quite far <laughs> in all best practices that we just mentioned. Um, I, I think, Kim, maybe we should open it up to, to you guys uh, here in the audience. And by the way, back home um, or home, wherever your home is, in the internet. Um, if you have any questions for the people here in the panel or any best practices that you would like to share, please raise your hand. Are there any questions for the panel? Not that I can see here. Willem? Yeah. Wait, wait, I'm coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, hi, I'm Willem from the Buren. Um, I was wondering, you, um, all three of you talk about societal projects and a lot of impact on communities. Um, I'm also interested in literary form. So can you maybe say something about how uh, these interactions change the forms in which the artists work? Hmm. I'm, I'm processing the question. Yeah. So <laughs> Uh, you mean, you were asking if the form of producing literature has changed because of the society involvement? Hmm. Um, th this, this is interesting because uh, I haven't reflected on that, so that would be really, you know, ad, ad hoc uh, answer. And I guess we are still, in, at least in Poland, uh, connected to this traditional uh, division between the traditional literature, which is printed, and this art performance on stage, spoken word uh, industry, and they don't overlap much. So I think that this is still ongoing process. And I think that this change that you are asking about will happen in the following maybe years, because we are quite conservative on this matter. So uh, this is something to be expected, but I cannot spot the difference now. Maybe my colleagues from Poland could, I don't know. I'm not, I don't want them to just <coughs> speak up if they're not comfortable. And maybe you have answers because I'm, I don't. Uh, well, I think I, I can see a little bit. Um, for example, um, with our trad project, uh, yeah, 
project uh, on clinical stri trials. Project, oh, yeah, sorry? Development pro programs. Yeah, the <laughs> development <laughs> programs, yes. Um, uh, what we do there uh, is exactly trying to make the writers uh, work in other fields, uh, so work with the, the community. And I think this gives them other perspectives. Um, for example, uh, we just had uh, in the beginning of the month a uh, Wintertown Festival uh, in, in uh, Nijmegen, and uh, we had uh, a panel uh, with um, the uh, Schreibers from the uh, the writers from the Schreiber Platz and uh, uh, the writers who were the um, the instructors during the the, the workshops and um, was interesting uh, to see how they interact with each other because of course you have to be open and uh, when I say open is completely open because uh, the communication is hard so I think they have to develop um, a little bit of patience and uh, empathy and I think this is a big change. So maybe not something that uh, you could translate in a book or maybe yes, uh, but uh, you can see in the way that you do your job. So, and I think this is a big, a really big change. Maybe, maybe just to add to this question, Willem, thank you. Um, um, I think there is, there is something interesting going on when it comes to collectiveness. For instance, uh, Denise, you're also involved in a project that's called Robot Stories, in which writers write ro stories collectively uh, for people with dementia. Um, and there we see a change in what we perceive as, as uh, authorship and ownership and uh, the way we deal with rights, because the stories don't belong to one writer anymore, but to different writers. Yeah. And another thing maybe, but that's something to think about, I'm not sure, is that we see in, in a lot of literature nowadays the choir returning. I think the choir uh, left literature when capitalism came, <laughs> uh, more or less. And um, uh, But if you look, for instance, at um, Alex Fitz, but also the books uh, by and the projects by Ali Smith, um, you see a collectiveness there, collective writers, but also a collectiveness of, of perspective telling the story. It's also interesting to think about responsibility of literary institutions in that way, that how can we provide literary creators, be it translators or writers, with the right <coughs> context. And also, these are also competences to be able to work collectively, to collaborate, to work with really div high diversity of, of target groups, of audiences, of participants. Um, there's maybe also a responsibility there to share the expertise we have or the how, how can we do that more or better or what would you need to do that? I'm wondering if I can try to answer both your question and Willem's. <laughs> <laughs> Just to combine <laughs> the answer. Uh, so if to begin with Willem and about the form, um, in Ukraine we actually have seen a change uh, since war. Uh, poetry uh, became leading um, form for artists, writers, uh, maybe because it helps to uh, document the feelings of a person within a specific short period of time frame, even whether you are in a bomb shelter or in your flat or uh, in the trenches. And uh, war poetry in Ukraine uh, became very, very, um, uh, not s spread, but it, uh, it, it received uh, a huge um, a way of uh, communicating what the news would not communicate, because the news usually may not show the whole the whole uh, picture, but with with the poetry you hear uh, one one story of one moment of one person, and then um, we've had one of the projects that uh, translatorium Ukrainian literature uh, uh, Ukrainian literature translation festival organized together with. Um, German festival of uh, uh, fiction translation, uh, trans, um, Translationale Berlin, I believe. Uh, sorry if I missed it. And uh, 
in June of 2022, uh, they organized readings of the war poetry by Ukrainian artists uh, in Zoom, uh, together with uh, translators into German. And uh, so that would be uh, Ukrainian readings in Ukrainian, and then German translators would translate and read their translation after. And then after this reading, the discussion would happen in English. And after a series of these uh, events that happened throughout the year, uh, they realized that uh, it's, uh, the, all of the uh, information that was collected uh, was worth of um, sharing wider, for example, during the festival, having the discussion and in print. And they are now preparing the book for print with all of those translations. But there was a way for, um, for institutions, both two festivals, to uh, provide a platform for writers who actually became translators of the feelings they go through of, of the situation into the poetry using this form of poetry and then to communicate them together with the German translators. And it was a very interesting um, experience and um, I feel like uh, this creativity in how you approach different um, projects may also be um, the key. Uh, to uh, to our programming. Wonderful. I think some answers to your question, Willem, and um, and also very nice to hear that one of the answers is yes, poetry. <laughs> Any other questions from you, or maybe from the uh, from the um, from the chat people? Uh, um, I think we are about then. If you're okay with that, to round up, we will have another round with another panel, but um, before we start with that, we have a break, and I would first like to thank you, Ella, Denise, and Irina, for uh, this contribution. I think, I don't know how you experience this, Kim, but when you start this kind of discussions, it's always the question, is there a means, is there, um, is there yeah. hope? For is there hope? Yeah. Is there hope? Yeah. And I derive a lot of hope from your, your best practices and also from the energy that you put into this. So I would like to thank you very much and hope to, um, yeah. Keep hope up the good work. Good, the good work, that's <laughs> what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Ella Denise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. can go for a quick break, five minutes, to change up for the next panel here uh, and see you back in five. Thank you.